Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see each one of you. It is an awesome privilege that we have to be able to gather openly and freely and uh, worship and praise the living God. Uh, it's definitely a, a privilege that many in our world do not have. And uh, I'm very grateful that we do have it. And I'm very grateful that you are exercising your freedom today uh, to come and worship the Lord. Um, God is amazing, and He is amazing all the time. You know, when we think God's not doing anything, He's doing so many things we can't even fathom all that He is doing. And, you know, it's amazing to, to know uh, that God's always orchestrating everything uh, from time beginning to time end for the good of those who love Him and have been called according to His purpose. You know, that's not a, that's not a matter of my feeling. That's not a matter of my opinion. That's a matter of truth. And, uh, you know, just to know that God is sovereignly in control and He's working in behalf of all of those who love Him has been called according to His purpose. I don't have to understand to be able to praise God. I don't have to see how things come together to be able to praise God. Praising God is a choice. And it's a choice that each one of us should make because of just how amazing he is. Uh, we're going to jump a little bit and go to Luke 24. Uh, we finished Judges 17. We worked that one over pretty good for three weeks. And uh, we're going to be in Luke 24 today. Uh, the title is wrong, but that's not anybody's fault but mine. Um, Whenever I was asked about the title, I was not around my notes. Um, but it's still a question. And the question that we're going to be thinking about uh, this, this morning is, where do you turn? Where do you turn? Where do you turn? Uh, Luke 24, we're going to begin in verse 13. And we're going to read through the end of this chapter together. It's uh, quite a few verses, but it really, uh, the thought process kind of goes together. Uh, so uh, I want us to read it in its entirety. Uh, Jesus Christ has been uh, crucified uh, for, for our sin. He had been uh, buried and he had been resurrected. And uh, we find uh, this, this event that took place uh, after Christ's resurrection. Uh, beginning in verse 13, it says, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visit visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and the ruler, our, our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And since all these things took, uh, and what is more, it is the third day since all these things took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ 
have to suffer these things and then enter His glory. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He explained to them what was said in all the Scripture concerning Himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if He were going farther. But they urged Him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So He went in to stay with them. When He was at the table with them, He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized Him, and He disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while He talked with us on the road and opened the Scripture to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those uh, with them assembled together and uh, saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they, uh, and while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scripture. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you, I am going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When He had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, He lifted up His hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Let's pray together this morning. Our Father in heaven, Lord, I do stand amazed, God, in your presence as I think about, um, Lord, just the vastness of all that you have created Father, it is you who has spoken the, the very earth in which we live and the being. It's you who have placed each star in the sky. And you are the one that knows them by name. Father, you are the one that knows all the things that mankind is still discovering and, and coming to know and understand. Father, you simply spoke it into being. God, you hold the world in your hand. And, and Father, with all of this truth, God, you still care about us, even though we are but dust, created from the dirt. Father, you are amazing. God, your love is, is never ending. The vastness of it, how, how deep and wide and high. Lord, it's beyond our comprehension. Yet you have made it known. And you have made it known through the sending of your one and only Son, Jesus Christ. 
Father, we thank You for salvation. God, we know that we are not deserving of it. It's, it's Your grace. It's Your mercy. It's a gift. It's because of Your love for us in spite of us. God, I thank You for, for making salvation possible. And I thank You for working in our hearts. Working in our lives to, to bring us to points of brokenness. So that we can turn unto You by faith. God, I thank You for the transformation that takes place right there within our hearts when we surrender and we cry out to Jesus, inviting Him to be our Lord, to be our Savior, to wash us and, and cleanse us. God, I thank You for Your Spirit that You give us at that very moment. Not to make us religious, but to make us new on the inside that, that works its way out within our lives. Father, we are Yours. We have been bought and paid for in full. And Father, our desire today is to know You more. Father, I pray that You would open our minds. I pray that You would open our hearts. Lord, the truth. Truth that maybe we've never seen or understood Truth, maybe that we've seen in part, but God, you, you would open our hearts and minds to the new depths of it today. And Father, I pray, God, that your spirit would just have the freedom in this place to do as, as you see fit. Father, I pray that as your word is proclaimed, God, I pray that it would not return into you, boy. But I pray that it would make the eternal impact in each of our hearts. And God, that we would, we would give ear unto you. And God, that we would be willing. We would even be eager. God, to take those steps of faith. Trusting you. Aligning ourselves unto you. Our Lord, our God, and our Master. Father, I really have nothing to say. But God, I know you do. So Father, I pray that you might use me as a, as a vessel. Pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would give me every word to say. And I just pray, Father, that as your word goes out, as you work in our lives, as only you can, I pray that Jesus be lifted high. And that we praise him and give him honor. That is be his name. And I pray all these things in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Where do you turn? Where do you turn when you don't understand? When you absolutely do not understand what's going on in your life or maybe the lives of people around you or maybe in the world in which we live, where do you turn? Where do you turn when you're confused? You know those times that, that you're just, you're scattered brain. You know we all have those moments. I, I just want to encourage everybody here. We all have those moments where we're just confused. We're just scattered. Where do you turn? When you find yourself in that situation and, and you don't know which end's up and which end's down, you don't know which way to turn, you're just confused. Maybe it's about your finances. Maybe it's about your own personal life. Maybe it's about relationships. Maybe it's about occupation. But when you're just confused, where do you turn? Where do you turn when you're worried, when you're stressed out. Now I know Scripture tells us that we're not to worry. It tells us that we're to be anxious for nothing. But let's not fool ourselves. Everybody deals with stress. Everybody deals with worry. Where do you turn? Maybe when you're worried about a kid. Maybe when you're worried about how much month you have left and, and you only have enough money for a week. What do you do, where do you turn when you're worried, when you are absolutely stressed out? Where do you turn when you have doubt? Again, I know we're not supposed to doubt, but let's be real, we all have doubts. 
And if you think you don't have doubts, you just hang in there. I promise you, God will allow you to be in situations. He will allow you to be in circumstances where you will doubt. I mean, John the Baptist, after he proclaimed that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, once he was put in prison, he sent his disciples to Jesus to ask, are you the one that we're really expecting? I mean, after he had so confidently said that Jesus is the Christ, when he found himself in difficult circumstances, uncertain circumstances, he had doubt that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was in fact God in flesh, and he doubted. Where do you turn when you have doubts? When you doubt if God really can work in your loved one's life. When you have doubt that God really can change you. When you have doubt that God is in control in this world that seems like it's out of control, where do you turn? Where do you turn when you're broken hearted? I mean, when your heart feels like it's been shattered in two? There's a lot of things that do that in our lives. Sometimes it's the passing of loved ones. You know, there's, there's a toll that that is, that, that is taken when we have loved ones that pass away. Maybe when relationships dissolve. Maybe when you have expectations for someone in your life and, and, and they take steps and it seems like those expectations will never be met and you're just broken hearted. When you look at this world, and, and the direction it's going. And you see so many people that, that need salvation and yet it seems like they're turning further and further away from God. And because you are seeking God, you have a, a broken heart. Where do you turn? Where do you turn when you're overwhelmed? You know, life at times will be very overwhelming. You know, sometimes we we put on these fronts like we've got this. You know, we put on these fronts and we we come in, in, in congregations and crowds and, and we walk around and we smile. And and we pretend that that we're in control and we we've got this thing called life. But let me tell you something about life. Everybody except the Lord Himself, at times, are overwhelmed. Where do you turn? Where do you turn when it seems like all hope is gone? I mean, there are times that it seems like all hope gone. Sometimes that's within our life personally. Sometimes that's within a family unit. Sometimes it's in the nation in which you live. Sometimes it's in the day that you live. Sometimes it just seems like, I'm not talking about knowing the truth. I'm talking about how it seems. Sometimes it just seems like all hope is gone. That there's no hope for certain things within our lives. Where do you turn during those times? Where do you turn when it seems like your future is dim? You know? Sometimes you're looking ahead and it just doesn't look that good. Where do you turn? In our text today, we find two of Jesus' disciples and they are in these circumstances. They are right in the middle of exactly what I've been talking about. They're uncertain. They have doubts. Their future seems dim. They're confused. They're, they're frustrated. They're, they don't understand. They're overwhelmed. See, Jesus' disciples believe that when the Messiah came, that He was going to come on the scene and He was going to set up an earthly kingdom that He was going to deliver the Israelites, the people of God, out of the dominion of the people of this world. And He was going to raise up a kingdom here and now. And that was their expectation. And those who were following Jesus, they believed Him to be the Messiah. They believed Him to be God in flesh, the Savior of the world. And they expected Him to deliver the Israelites 
out from under Roman rule. They expected him to show everybody that he was God and that he was he was king and he was going to subject everybody unto himself and to his people, the Israelites. That's what they expected. Yet Jesus Christ went to Golgotha. And he was beat beyond recognition. And he had been nailed to an old rugged cross. And that cross had been stood up. And it was there that, that he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And it's there that he, he breathed his last and he gave up his spirit. And they took him down from that cross and, and they carried him and placed him in a tomb. Physically dead. They placed his body in that tomb. And it's been three days. And there's a report going around on this day. His body, it's missing. It's gone. His disciples did not know where it was. There was reports coming back that, that there had been some angels that had been seen at the tomb and, and they were saying that He's alive. That He's been risen. And we have these two disciples who are traveling to Emmaus. And they're confused and they don't understand. They don't know what's going on. Their, their future, it looks dim. They're uncertain. Notice where they turn. They turn to each other. Verse 13 and 14 of the text, it says, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other. You know, I'm grateful for the people that God allows to be in my life. Because I gain a lot of encouragement and strength from, from people. I'm thankful for brothers and sisters in Christ. Because there's times that I just don't see and I don't understand. And, and God has people in my life and they, they give great counsel and they, they help me refocus in my life. And I'm very grateful for my family. Very grateful for my wife and my kids and my mom and my in-laws because, you know, when things seem like they're falling apart, they're there. And I'm very grateful for every person that God allows me to share life with. But you and I need to understand something. When everything's falling apart, when we don't understand, when our future, it looks dim, when, when things are, are, are dwelling up within us and doubt is arising. People around us may be the most convenient, but they're not the best ones to turn to. The disciples, these two that's going to Emmaus, they turn to one another. And they're, they're discussing the events of their day. They're, they're trying to figure out what's going on. They're trying to bring about some kind of understanding between themselves. They also turn to their circumstances. If you look at verse 14 through 24, they're going over the events. They thought Jesus was going to be the Messiah, that He was the Messiah, that He was going to set up this kingdom, but now He's been crucified and He's been buried and, and, and now His body's gone. And, and they, they turn to their circumstances. They turn to one another and they turn to them circumstances. Does that sound familiar to you? See, that's the human response when we don't understand what's happening. When we're confused, when we have doubts, when, when our future looks dim, that's what we naturally do. We turn to, uh, to other people and we, we, we look at our circumstances and, and we end up just like these disciples. Notice the results of them turning to one another and looking, focusing on their circumstances. You see the result in verse 17. 
It says that they stood still, their faces downcast. See, when we try to figure out life together, looking at our circumstances, it can be very frustrating. When we turn to one another and we focus on our circumstances, listen, confusion can get bigger. And you know what? We can find ourselves being downcast, depressed. We can find ourselves still in the middle of doubt. Still uncertain about everything around us. But I want us to notice today where Jesus points His disciples. Because He points them in a better direction. Instead of turning to one another and instead of focusing on their circumstances, notice what Jesus does. He points them to the Word. Look, if you would, verse 25 and also verse 27 of the text. It says, He said to them, How foolish you are, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. You see that? Jesus says, Look, what about what the prophets have said? Jesus says, In the midst of this uncertain time of your life, what about the Scripture? What about the Word of God? He points them to the Word of God, also in verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He explained to them what was said in all the Scripture concerning Himself. Now I want you to know that's something different than what comes naturally. It comes natural to us to turn to one another. It comes natural to us to look at the circumstances. Jesus says, what about my Word? How often do you run to the Word of God when you don't understand? When you have doubts in your life, how often do you seek out God's face in His Word? When your future looks dim, when it seems hopeless, maybe a situation or a circumstance, how often do you run to the Word of God? Jesus wants us to understand that He is more than willing to answer our question, to bring about understanding in the midst of our understanding, to bring faith instead of doubt, but we've got to turn to His Word. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, I just don't know a lot about Scripture. I was talking to a lady uh, this week, talking to her about the Lord. And, and she kept telling me over and over and over, I, I think I understand the things of God, but I've never read, read the Word of God. Well, how can you understand the things of God if you've never read the Word of God? You know, there's so much hope. There, there's so much meaning. There's so much understanding in life and, and in everlasting life in the Word of God. There are answers. There are, there are solutions. There is direction. Listen, it is the living Word of God that God gives counsel through by His Holy Spirit. And not if we find ourselves in these unsettled times, but when we find ourselves in these unsettled times, the Lord wants us to turn to His Word. 2 Samuel 22, verse 31 says, The word of the Lord is flawless. Hebrews 4, 22 says, For the word of God is living and active. Scripture gives other counsel about the word. The word of God is living. It's eternal. It's active. It's flawless. It's true. It's the way. It's life. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light for our path. It gives godly counsel. It teaches. It rebukes. It corrects. It trains in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Listen, there is great value in the Word of God. You know it's the number one selling book of all time? There's got to be a reason. 
I'm not talking about one generation. I'm not talking about just, just one point in history. I'm talking of all time, of all of mankind. It's the number one selling book. I think there's something here. And how often do we allow the Word of God to sit on a shelf in our, in our house when we're facing these times of uncertainty and doubt and hopeless feelings and, and misunderstandings? How often do we not go to the Word, we turn to each other and we look at our circumstances? And the Lord says, look, when you find yourself in those times, listen, turn to the Word. He said, where do I start? Listen, just pick it up and start. It's amazing to me how when you pick it up and you're seeking counsel from God, listen, God's Spirit makes application of His Word within our lives. The important thing is to actually pick it up and to seek God. And to seek His wisdom and His guidance in the situation that you find yourself in. And I'm telling you, over and over and over and over again, God will bring guidance and He will speak truth in your life. And I'm here to tell you that it makes a huge eternal impact within each and every life that we'll turn to. Jesus says, look, turn to the Word. Let me just encourage you, listen, if you're not having a quiet time every day, a quiet time is so important. Don't you think that every day God's got a will and plan for your life? He does. Listen, God has direction for you. He wants to speak to you. And it's important that you give Him time in your day for Him to speak into your life. Let me suggest very early in the morning, it's amazing to me the number of times me getting up and being in the Word of God that God gives me the counsel that I need specifically for events in the day that's fixing to unfold. And if I would have missed it, I wouldn't even have known God's will and His direction and plan for that situation and that circumstance. I can't tell you the number of times that God has spoken in my own life in these situations that I don't understand. Now, He doesn't always explain everything, but He gives just the word that's needed to bring peace to the soul and to hold on to me in the midst of the storm so that I will be patient and let Him carry me through. The Lord says, look, when you're in these times, turn to the Word of God. Secondly, he says, turn to the Father's will. Notice if you would in verse 26. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter His glory? Whose plan was it for the Messiah to come? Whose plan was it for Jesus, the Son of God, to come and dwell among men, live a sinless life, go to the cross, be buried, be resurrection, resurrected for the atonement, the payment of man's sin? Whose plan was that? That was the Father's. You know when that plan came into being? Before time ever started. Before the world ever existed. It was God's will and God's plan from the very beginning. You need to understand that your life is not about you. It's about a will of a divine being. He knows you before you are even brought into this world as you are being knit together in your mother's womb. He knows you intimately and personally and He has a plan for your life. And guess what? Your plan fits in a greater plan. And it's an eternal plan. And in the midst of this situation that Jesus' disciples find themselves in, the confusing time of not understanding that it seems like their future is dim, that things are hopeless, they're having doubts. Listen, God says, think about the Father's will. Didn't the Christ have to suffer? Friend, you need to understand that if Jesus had not come and been crucified on the cross, there would be no hope for mankind. Listen, it's through the, the blood, the death of Jesus that sin is paid for. God doesn't just sweep sin under the rug. He dealt with it through His one and only Son, Jesus Christ. 
It was the will of the Father. It was the redemptive plan. It was God's will to bring about an eternal kingdom for Himself. And He turns their minds to God's will. I'm here to tell you, God's will can settle your soul in the midst of turbulent situations. Because when we're living life, all we see is one little piece of the puzzle. All we see is just what's right around us. And guess what? The people that are around us, a lot of times, all they can see is what we're in. And they only reason from the thought process of this world. And they give us counsel according to opinion instead of according to truth. And I'm here to tell you that God is sitting in heaven and He is sovereignly on His throne. Things aren't out of control no matter what we see or think. And we need to consider His will and His plan when we're in the midst of unsettled times. We need to back out of our situation. And we need to think much bigger than ourselves. We need to think eternally. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus does with His disciples in the midst of this time. He points them to the, to the Word. And He points them to the Father's will. And notice, thirdly, He points them to Himself. We see that in verse 30 through verse 42. Where He, he comes unto them and he, he reveals the Scripture about Himself. And He opens their minds whenever He breaks the bread about Himself. They're conversing with one another and He's saying, look, you need to be conversing with Me. You need to be turning to Me. You need to be focusing on Me. Jesus turns His disciples' thoughts to Himself. He is an eternal. I'm here to tell you, if you try to work out everything in your life just in this life, you'll be a very frustrated person. You can be a believer and you will still be very frustrated. Because let me tell you something, this is a spiritual world word and it's an eternal word. And I'm here to tell you, God has followed through on all of His promises and He will not cease to do that. But it may not be in this life. It may be in the eternal life. And in the midst of these unsettled times, the Lord wants us to turn to Himself. What are the results that takes place within our lives when we turn to the Word, when we turn to the Father's will, and we turn to Jesus Christ Himself? What are the results of that? Remember the results if we turn to each other and, 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 and we look at our circumstances? We end up downcast. We end up needing medication. But, but what if we turn to the Word of God and we turn to the Father's will, we turn to Jesus Christ? Notice the results. There is understanding. Look if you would in verse 44. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Then He opened their minds so that they could understand the Scripture. Isn't that amazing? You want to know where understanding comes? It doesn't come from intellect. It doesn't come by going to the best Bible classes. It comes from being in the Word, focusing it on the Father's will, and being with Jesus. He's the one that brings understanding in the midst of our lives. And I'm here to tell you, He's still doing it. You want understanding? You've got to turn to the Word, the Father's will, to Jesus. And He will bring understanding. Let me just say this, just as a little side note, He'll do it in His time. You know, sometimes the understanding that we really need, it has nothing to do with what we want God to say. And He'll let us struggle in the Word until we're broken and we're open to the understanding He wants us to have. But I'm here to tell you, the results of turning to the Word and God's will and to Jesus, He brings 
understanding. Secondly, listen, there is a promise and power to proceed forward in our life. You know, there's times that we just don't see the future anymore. You know, there's a lot of people, they get to that point and they just don't want to live anymore. They don't see any point in life. No future. There's all kinds of events that takes place in our life that can bring anybody to that point. But listen, when we turn to the Word and the Father's will and to Jesus, He gives us power and the promise so that we can proceed. Look if you would in verse 49. He says, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Man, there's, there's this supernatural event that's going to take place. It's the day of Pentecost. Jesus has been telling His disciples, listen, something different is going to happen. God's Spirit is going to be sent. When I, when I go back to the Father's right hand, this is going to be a New Testament covenant. My Holy Spirit is going to live in the hearts and souls of my people. This is a promise. And it's the power needed so that you can proceed in life to face what they're facing to face. And that's severe persecution for the name of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Man. They turn to the Word and they turn to the Father's will to Jesus and, and they have a promise of the power to proceed. Listen, Jesus will give you the empowerment by His Spirit to move forward the very next step in your life. You think you can't? He can. But you got to let Him. Notice another result. Listen, God's blessing within their life. Now let me tell you something. God's blessing is not just things of this world. God's blessings are much greater than the things of this world. I'm telling you, I am blessed with the family I have. I am blessed with the kids I have. Is, is it monetary things? No. Nope. No, nope. let me tell you something. There's not enough money in the world to buy them. I'm blessed with the mom I have. I'm blessed with the calling that I have. I'm blessed to get to be able to be among uh, the people that I get to share life with. I am blessed to have a peace of mind and heart. I'm here to tell you, I sleep real well. You know why? Because of my God. I can face tomorrow because He lives knowing that He is in control and upon His thrones. Listen, they turn to the Word and to the Father's will and to Jesus and they receive God's blessing. Look if you would in verse 50. When He had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, He lifted up His hands and blessed them. That's awesome. Verse 51, while He was blessing them, Right in the middle of his, his blessing, he's fixing to go back to heaven. Wow. Man, I want to be blessed to God. I ain't talking about just being rich and having a big old fine house. All that stuff's going to diminish one day. If God wants us to have that, praise the Lord. But if He don't, just Him. The blessing of Him. The blessing of His Spirit. The blessing of walking with the living God. When we turn to His Word, we turn to the Father's will and to Jesus Himself, man. We receive blessing from God. And let me tell you something. You can't outbless God. This world can't give you anything that can even compare to the blessings of God. Real joy. Real peace. A clean conscience. Man, real life. The Holy Spirit. Real blessing. When we turn to where the Lord tells us. Fourth, he brings joy. And man, I'm talking about real worship of God. Let me tell you something. Worshiping God is not about the beat of music. It's not about who's leading in worship. Listen, it's not even about us coming together to corporately worship. Worship is, is a life. It's a life lived unto God as living sacrifices. In Romans it says that's our reasonable act of worship. When we turn to the Word and the Father's will and to Jesus Himself, we have real joy. And we, we really worship God in spirit and in truth. Notice if you would in verse 52 and 53. It says, Then they worshipped Him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. Man, do you have to talk these guys into going to church? Oh no, they didn't want to leave. They didn't want to leave. Man, they wanted to be with, with other believers 
praising God all the time. You know why? Because they were in a, a, a confused state. They were in a state in which their future looked dim and they had doubts and they didn't understand. And they turned to one another and they looked at their circumstances. They were downcast and Jesus said, wait a minute, wait a minute, stop. Look, turn to my word. Think about the Father's will. Turn to me. And they did. And they understood. And they had, had promise and power to proceed forward. They, they had this understanding. They had, they had real joy. They had the blessing of God. And let me tell you something. God offers it to every one of us in the midst of our uncertain times. You know what we have to answer? We have to answer this question. Where? No, I have to know. Are you having a hard time understanding something that's going on in your life? That seem like you don't have much of a future? Are, are there doubts that just they continue to play in your mind, continue to play in your heart? Things just seem uncertain. Where are you turning? Maybe you're talking to everybody around you. And I praise God for everybody around you. God uses them too. But there's somebody better to turn to than one another. Maybe you're, you're so focused on your, your circumstances. Man, it's hard to see the glory of God when all you're focusing on is the things of this world. You know what? You may be downcast. You may be depressed. You may be bummed out. You may be looking to the things of this world to try to bring some relief, some hope. You want me to tell you where Jesus wants you to turn? To His Word. He wants you to he wants you to focus on the Father's will plan for your life. He wants you to look to Him. And I'm here to tell you there's understanding right there. There's power. There's power of promise to proceed forward by faith. There's blessing of God that you can't even imagine. I tell you what, when God does that work in your life, nobody will have to talk to you into worship, man. People can't stop you from worshiping and praising God. It doesn't matter if you're riding down the road or sitting in your house, man. You've got to say, praise Jesus. I'm telling you what. That right there, that's real hope. And that's real life. You know what God says? 